Hi, I'm Gia, and I just wanted to have a chat with all you mixed kids out there because I know that what we're going through is crazy and hard and difficult, and I know that it's really emotionally heavy and just as much for you as it is for me, so I wanted to talk uh, to you because I feel like there's an experience that we're grappling with that is different than other people. So I, growing up, was very, <laughs> I growing up just always had people ask, what are you? And as much as I tried to fit in, I always had these people reminding me of how I was different. And they would ask me, like just strangers would come up to this, to me on the street and look at me and say, what are you? And it would, it would shift between a kind of, ooh, you're so exotic, what are you? And a kind of aggressive, I can't figure out what you are, so you need to tell it to me. And what I learned over time is that I needed to figure out how I identify. And I identify as mixed. And I had a really hard time growing up because I I saw these mono-ethnic people and they would talk about their experiences and blah, 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 but I didn't feel like I saw people who looked like me and identified like me. The one exception being Tiger Woods, and I remember him growing up, he would say, you know, I'm, I'm not one thing. If I, if I were to say I'm black, it means that I'm denying my mother and, you know, it's, it's important to me to honor all of who I am. And especially for those of us who are raised predominantly by the side of our family that isn't black, I think there's this extra kind of challenge, you know, because it's like I, I grew up in this world, in this loving family with these amazing people, and they are a huge part of who I am. And most of how I identify, most of my cultural practices, most of what I'm used to, like that's, that's me. And so for you to tell me that I'm this other thing, like it doesn't make sense to me, it doesn't feel right. So I've spent my whole life asserting the ways and making sure people knew that I'm not black, I'm mixed. And I would do things, I mean, I still do, like I straighten my hair sometimes and I would notice the difference in the way I was treated, you know, having more ethnic ambiguity versus being perceived to be belong, belonging to a certain ethnic group. And I just, I would really challenge people who would put me in a box because I never belonged. And I feel like that's part of the identity of mixedness is that you don't, feel often like you belong. Like I, I didn't belong amongst my white friends. And when I would interact with black kids at school, like they would a lot of times be so mean to me. And I just, I didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. And I feel like that's the classic um, mixed kid experience is feeling like you don't belong. And that's why I've always pushed so hard for this like identity, our own identity that is what mixed is and that that's what feels good to me. However, um, I've been thinking about that, like since what happened with George Floyd and since what's happening around the world, I've been, there's always been this internal something and it's coming out now. And I've been had like, <laughs> and I don't know if you've had this, but I've had friends reach out to me and say, hey, I'm thinking about you. And what I've realized is that no matter how much I've asserted myself as being mixed, so many of them have always thought of me as black. And it's been really hard for me to, to think about that and what that means because I've never felt black. And I've been doing a lot of uh, research into things like white fragility and um, just around race and protesting and things. 
and uh, and I've been noticing the more I've been doing that, the more people have been tagging me like, oh, black photographer, or, oh, hire this black photographer, and it just doesn't feel like me. It doesn't feel like who I am, and it hurts me. So I've been thinking a lot about why it hurts me. And it's hurt me because I've always, this whole time, felt like I've been, I would be dishonoring, I would be negating, like this whole huge part of my family. But I've also realized something that I've grown up in this culture, and I'm in the United States, but I believe it's the same no matter where you are in the world. I've grown up in a culture where we live, breathe, eat, sleep, racist ideology. And I've been infected by the poison of racism, just like everybody else. And while there is a part of me that does believe in, in, in having an identity as a mixed person, I'm also now accepting that part of that was to distance myself from blackness because I grew up in a culture that tells me that blackness is wrong and it's shameful and it's not as good. And and of course that's not true. <laughs> and it's not my fault that I, that I grew up in a culture that told me these things. But it's been impacting my behavior. And I've had to realize that I have racism that lives in me, just like everyone else. And this was the one of the ways it's been coming out. And I've always thought about, you know, people who have said, yeah, you're black, you need to own it, you're black. And I've always thought about where that comes from. And it comes from this one drop rule, right, which was meant to torture, have an excuse to torture more people because as people started mixing, they either became closer to whiteness or they became people that you had the right lawfully to control. And the, I've, I've, I remember watching a little bit of Roots growing up and just it traumatized me. And ever since then, I've just avoided understanding that history because it just felt too scary to look at because the truth is me, probably you, my cousins who have white skin, straight hair and green eyes, because we share ancestors who are black, we would have been tortured just like everybody else. And that's a really hard thing to realize when you grow up in a culture that is taught you subconsciously that because you're closer to whiteness you're you're not like that and that's the truth and i don't want to be racist i don't think anybody wants to be racist and so i think the responsibility is seeing it and owning it and trying to, to change it. And what I've come to learn in the last few days is that blackness is an umbrella and it includes experiences from people all over the world. People who've grown up in different experiences in the continent of Africa, people who have grown up in different experiences in the United States, the Afro-Latinos in Central and South America, people all over, all over the world, indigenous peoples all over the world. Like it's blackness is an umbrella that, that has room for people like us. And it's important right now I mean, I guess it's always been important, but I'm realizing that right now it's really important to own that and to sit under that umbrella because the more we come together and the more we support each other, the more change that can happen. And there's power in me saying, yes, I'm mixed and I'm black. I'm black. And 
if, I mean, I think about coming out as gay and I didn't even feel this much with it. I just came out and I had a party for myself and I felt great. But because of the racism that I've, I've ingested over my whole life, I have all these feelings of shame and fear around identifying as black. And I don't feel black. I don't know what that feels like. I don't, I don't, I don't know. And I've been having conversations and I had a conversation with my amazing cousin Desiree, who's also mixed, but identifies as a mixed black woman. And I said out loud for the first time, which is so embarrassing to say, but I said out loud, I I don't want to be black. And, and she's amazing. <laughs> and she said, you know, that's actually the blackest thing you've ever said because you're seeing it and owning it and starting to understand what it means and starting to look at all the lies that we've been told about what that means. And I realized that all through my life, I've been self-sabotaging because there was always a part of me that hated a part of me and that was running from a part of me and I'm trying now to change that and to own that. And I really hope that one day I can do enough work where I can be proud of that part of me, that I can be proud to be black. But today the best I can do is to accept it because I'm very new in this journey. And I think that's when people, when they talk about privilege of mixed kids, I think that's what they're talking about, that I could have gone 36 years without having to look at a lot of this stuff. Like, yes, it was always there, but I could bury it and, and survive and function in the world and the microaggressions and things like that, they weren't obvious. Um, and that's what they mean. Like I, I've experienced a lot of privilege in that I'm now just dealing with it. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry to all the people who have, that I've hurt unintentionally because of my own internalized racism. And I'm, and I'm, I'm sorry that I, I'm sorry because I have these ancestors that must have just been shaking their heads the whole time. Um, but I'm doing my best and I'm trying and I would encourage all of you mixed kids, if you can, because I understand that a year ago if somebody had told me you're black, I would have said, don't, don't talk to me, you don't know me, you don't know my story, you don't get to tell me who I am. And so I, I get that you, you need to honor where you're at in your journey. But if you can, start to imagine yourself in that space under the black umbrella. There's power in that. And there's relief in that, in stopping the fight. And knowing that like, yes, I am mixed and yes, I honor all the parts of me. And part of that is this complicated history because I have probably descendants of people who tried to own other people. And I have also a part of me, I'm a descendant of people who were tortured and kidnapped for hundreds of years by those people. And it is a tough experience, but, but I think there's something really beautiful in actually feeling like there's a space because I've never felt like there was a space for me and maybe there's a space for us <laughs> that's under this black umbrella and that the privilege that comes with that we can use to support other people in that umbrella 
And the more we can share our experiences, I think there's power in that. And learning to love ourselves and learning to be black. I feel like I'm gonna have to keep practicing saying it because right now even saying I'm black just feels, it doesn't feel right. But I'm a mixed black woman and that makes me a black woman and that's okay. All right, well, I just wanted to say that and talk through it and I don't know. I just wish I had had someone to help me talk through this, everything and figure it out. And I, I just want you to know I see you and I love you and I want to honor you wherever you're at in your mixed skin journey. And if you do have the capacity to start seeing start seeing it I, I hope that for you I mean it's not easy and it sucks and I am feeling shitty most of the time but uh, but I also feel relieved And I feel like there was a part of myself that wasn't fully living because I didn't fully want to be seen, even to myself, if that makes sense. And uh, I don't know, I'm hopeful that I'm really embracing and accepting things that that it will change things for me and I can love myself more because I think anytime you deny a part of yourself you can't fully love yourself and anytime you experience shame you're you're worried that you're not lovable and you are all parts of you are totally lovable just like all parts of me are totally lovable. And I think it's a journey to figure that out. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm sending you lots of love on your journey. <laughs>